Good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm delighted to be here with uh, such an impressive international crowd. And uh, I was very happy when I asked Krista how to say hello in German. She said, hello. So, hello. And uh, I'm sorry, I haven't learned uh, a lot of different languages for all the countries represented here today. And I really haven't prepared um, any formal remarks. I just thought I might tell you a little bit about my personal story. Uh, some of the things that, that Mark didn't mention, and Mark, by the way, is one of the nicest, most impressive, kindest, most compassionate doctors I've ever met. And I always say, when you look up Bedside Manor in the dictionary, it should have a picture of Mark Bechapin. <laughs> he was uh, Jay's doctor, his gastroenterologist, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our personal story in a moment, but if it weren't for Mark, I think uh, those very dark days would have been much, much darker, and he always provided us with just a sliver of hope, actually a lot of hope, when it was a pretty dire situation, and I'll be forever grateful to Mark, not only for his compassion and his caring of my husband and our family, but of course for his friendship in the 11 years, actually, uh, since my husband passed away of colorectal cancer at the age of 42. I also just wanted to, to say a big thank you to Krista, uh, and to Krista Marr and, and the Felix uh, Berta Foundation. And I know that I'm sure Krista has been very inspiring to many of you, and I think it only goes to show that one person can make an extraordinary difference. And that person doesn't have to anchor a morning show on national television or an evening newscast, but can be someone who is so passionate about an issue and so determined to help other people that that one individual can just have an extraordinary impact. So I really applaud Krista for all the great work she's done. I think I can say on both of our behalfs that in a way it's a bit selfish what we've done even though hopefully it has saved lives. But I think when you experience a devastating loss, the loss of a son, uh, which I can't imagine, having lost my husband and sister was so painful, but a child I know is devastating. But to be able to have that death not be in vain, to be able to actually do something about it. There's so many people I know who have contacted me who have experienced loss and they feel so helpless during the course of the disease. And it's a de disease that has no respect for income or socioeconomic status, or as you all know, geography. It affects people all over the world. But to actually be able to have an impact and to do something about it and to be a positive agent for change, I think has been extremely helpful for me personally, dealing with my loss, as I'm sure I think I can speak for Krista and say that's been a very helpful thing for her as well. Um, but I wanted to thank the, to Krista and the Felix Berta Foundation, the Network Against Colorectal Cancer, the IDCA, and of course, Mark and the Monahan Center for giving me the opportunity just to spend a little time with all of you. Um, I think it's really exciting that we're talking about this at an international level, um, not to be name droppy or anything, but I've got to know Queen Rania through the years covering uh, Jordan and the Middle East and King Abdullah, and I know this is something she cares deeply about. And if I have been at all inspiring to people in other parts of the world so they can start paying attention to what is the second leading cancer killer in this country and is certainly a, a huge problem throughout the world, I feel very special and gratified. Um, we all know the statistics, uh, what about, I always, um, I pretty much memorize them by now, 130,000 diagnosed in the United States every year, about 56,000 lose their lives, the same number of people who died during the course of the entire Vietnam War just in a single year, 13,000 people under the age of 50, this is a whole different area that hopefully we can talk about at some point, but the cost-benefit analysis of national screening or sort of uh, massive screening doesn't necessarily make sense um, in a public policy way, even though you know I feel like those 13,000 people should not be expendable individuals, and certainly they have a lot to offer society, and they're claimed at a very early age. And I guess uh, that's where I'd like to start, just to tell you all a little bit about my personal situation and why I did, why I have done what I've done uh, since Jay's death. 
Um, it was in the spring of 1997 uh, when uh, my husband started complaining that he wasn't feeling well. He did have some unexplained weight loss. Um, I noticed he was getting really thin, but typical you know, people in, I don't know, it was probably throughout the world, we were always trying to lose weight anyway, so we just thought he was eating healthier and it was having a positive effect. Um, he just didn't feel right. You know, there wasn't anything specific. I don't think he had any change in his bowel habits, although I didn't quiz him about that, not knowing a lot about colorectal cancer at the time. I don't think he had blood in his stools, but he could have because the occult part, of course, just means the change in color and not necessarily actual blood in the toilet bowl. Um, and he just kept saying, you know, I'm traveling a lot. We have two little girls. I'm exhausted. I know I'll feel better when the weather gets warmer. And of course, uh, uh, before the weather got warmer in April, he, our nanny, who's from Northern Ireland, who was at the time, if anybody from Ireland here, um, called me at work and said, Jay is doubled over in pain. And so, as many young men do or don't have, he, he didn't have a, an internist or a GP. I think there's, that's pretty common where a lot of young men think, why do I need a doctor? I feel fine. He was an athlete in college. He ate relatively well. He never smoked a cigarette, never smoked pot. He was a pretty straight arrow and drank, drank only moderately. So I immediately had him go to our doc, my doctor because I did have an internist. And uh, I remember uh, our doctor, my doctor, saying to Jay, I'm sure it's not cancer. And uh, of course, it turned out to be. Jay was fully obstructed with a tumor the size of probably a grapefruit or an orange, the fruit comparison, uh, and uh, immediately had to have a bowel resectioning and temporarily had a colostomy bag as well. Um, it was pretty shocking to go from being on top of the world, you know, having a career that exceeded my wildest expectations. Uh, great, successful husband who was a practicing attorney, uh, two healthy daughters who were at the time five and one, and uh, suddenly to have your world turned upside down by this shocking diagnosis of a, of a disease that I really didn't know anything about except for that Ronald Reagan had had polyps when he was president and had, I guess, cancerous polyps removed. And so that's really all I knew about colorectal cancer. Well, needless to say, I got a pretty quick uh, education in this disease and spent every waking hour doing research, perusing the wires. I got my coworkers at NBC, this is probably not kosher or ethical, so don't tell anyone, to uh, call pharmaceutical companies, various medical institutions, and um, academic centers across the country to find out what they were doing because after, soon after Jay was diagnosed, um, Tom Nash took me into one of those little rooms for patients' families at New York Hospital and informed me that, that the cancer had spread all over Jay's liver. So it was pretty bleak. And uh, I talked to a lot of people. Um, who's the guy, Mark, at NIH who's so well-respected, who was the head of NIH or the NCI? <coughs> at the time. Do you remember who I'm talking about? Well, I called him. I sent Jay his, his slides. I know that you all would know him. Not, not, not Dr. Klausner. No, it wasn't Harold Varmus either. Sorry. It's like, guess the oncologist. It was, uh, I know you guys know him. He's world renowned. I think he's, he's since left. Steve, I think it's, um, Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Rosenberg, yes, it's like Jeopardy for medical experts. Who is Dr. Rosenberg? Yes, I called Dr. Rosenberg, and uh, he said the situation was very, very bleak, uh, but we decided, and Jay was somebody who didn't really want to be involved in his care. I think people respond to a cancer diagnosis psychologically very differently, so I was sort of the, the research pit bull in the family, and... Uh, because it was so bad in his liver, we decided to put a hepatic pump in that, as you all know, 
put the chemotherapy directly in his liver and have the adjuvant therapy of systemic chemotherapy. And this is, of course, when 5-FU and leucoborin was the first line chemotherapeutic solution and ultimately while well, he had a response rate. And what they don't really tell you when you're a patient, if you have a response rate, even though it's a 22.5% likelihood of responding, if someone responds, you do like this happy dance and you think, oh my God, this is it, I'm out of the woods. Thank God, hallelujah. But they don't really tell you the response rate doesn't really last. So needless to say, uh, Jay's cancer returned with a vengeance and spread to his lung and later to his brain. And I don't mean to be telling you all these gruesome details, but it was pretty horrifying stuff. And he ultimately was given CPT-11, which I think was really, really hard to take uh, for him. And uh, this was before I'd been doing research on Sanofi, and then they come up with axiloplatin. I, you guys all know this kind of thing. And I think, you know, Avastin was just starting to, to be a, a possible therapy. But anyway, I learned a lot about cancer during those terrible nine months and about monoclonal antibodies and uh, anti-angiogenesis and Judah Folkman and, uh, you know, the RAS. Gene, is that it? Or anyway, all this stuff. So ultimately, it, 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 it wasn't really very, as you all know, the end of the story. Uh, Jay was incredibly um, brave and graceful and full of humor and really taught me a lot about living, watching him die. Um, but it was, it was pretty bleak. And... Uh, of course, he died on a Saturday morning in January of 1998. But going through all this, I realized how little the public knew about this disease. And so because I have this built-in bully pulpit known as the Today Show, which was, is a very popular morning show in this country, that I felt a real obligation to inform and educate the pu public so that they could hopefully avoid the same fate that um, had, had fallen upon Jay and, and our entire family. So that's when I decided to start the National Colorectal Cancer Research Alliance under the auspices of the Entertainment Industry Foundation. A friend of mine named Lily Tartikoff had done fantastic work for breast cancer, and her husband, Brandon, who'd been the president of NBC Entertainment, had died of lymphoma. And Lily was very active in the world of cancer. So I had lunch with her uh, not that long after Jay had passed away and you know, told her that I felt like this disease, there was a lot that wasn't known about it. So that's why we decided to, to raise awareness and raise research dollars. And clearly, when it comes to the world of cancer, oftentimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I thought it was high time that people paid attention to the second leading cancer killer in this country of men and women. So our, our really our goals were threefold. We wanted to come up with better prevention strategies, i.e. colonoscopies, and whether or not we could raise money to go into research so the, the colon cancer could be detected in its earliest stages, because as we all know, it's highly curable if it's detected early. We wanted to raise research dollars for treatment options so that people like Jay, hopefully down the road, will have more than one or two chemotherapeutic options and maybe some that don't involve chemotherapy. Um, you know, people who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer can often go to several different chemotherapies once they stop responding, but there, was very there are very few options for people, particularly with stage four or stage three colorectal cancer back in the late 1990s. And then finally, we wanted to raise awareness and tell people about this disease. So it did start with my on-air colonoscopy, which I know people thought I was absolutely crazy to do, but my motives were very pure and simple. I wanted to demystify the procedure and destigmatize it. And I thought if people saw me going through it, they would understand what it entailed and maybe talk to their doctors about it and be less trepidatious about the procedure. So I'll never forget having a camera crew in my kitchen as I drink the, uh, drank the uh, most inappropriately named beverage of all time, Go Lightly. <laughs> really, seriously, whoever thought of that? 
So uh, I drank it, and my uh, friend, John LePouc, uh, who's a gastroenterologist here in New York and also on the CBS Evening News, is our medical reporter now, told me to eat tropical fruit lifesavers and, and take a bite of lime as if I was drinking tequila. Um, I can tell you it really didn't help. It was one of the most uh, unpleasant experiences of my life. And finally, as I gulped the final glass of that big ass gallon of Go Lightly, I vomited all over my kitchen floor. So I made sure the cameraman destroyed that tape because I didn't think that would be very motivating for people back home to, to want to go through this procedure. So I, I actually, um, I, I did the colonoscopy and it got a lot of attention and I'm very, very happy that it did, I think, have a great effect and that it made people familiar with the procedure. And a little side note, uh, John, John LePouc had recommended I go to a doctor, uh, Dr. Ken Ford at Columbia, and I don't know if you, well, any of you all know Dr. Ford, but it was interesting because some of my African-American colleagues thanked me for using a black doctor. And I said, I never really thought about it, but it just goes to show how important symbolism is, even when it comes to a TV colonoscopy. So I, uh, I did that, that was my first step. And then I wanted to obviously do some other things and that's why the NCCRA was established. And uh, I think that you know, our awareness campaign has been extremely helpful and effective. I know at the University of Michigan, they came up with something called the Couric Effect, which showed a 20% rise in colonoscopies, not only after my TV colonoscopy, but after our, our efforts to just raise awareness. And I think that we discovered, as, as I know, I was just talking to Krista about this, the power of celebrity. You know, I often uh, bemoan the fact that we've become such a celebrity culture and, and people are so interested in movie stars when I think they should be much more interested in cancer researchers who I think are the unsung heroes of, and heroes of the world. But um, Krista was just telling me that she um, had someone do a celebrity colonoscopy in Germany and what a huge impact that had. So we thought we would marry, if you will, the celebrity loving culture with the importance of getting the word out about colorectal cancer. And we did a series of PSAs with people, and I think they were really very impactful because, for example, very few people know that Audrey Hepburn died of colon cancer. So we got her son, Sean Ferrer, to do a, a, a PSA for us. Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, died of colon cancer. We had Monty Schultz, his son, do a PSA for us. Uh, we've had a number of people, Diane Keaton's grandmother died of colon cancer. She did, of course, an adorable Diane Keaton PSA for us, as only she could. Morgan Freeman, because we wanted to reach out to the African American community, which uh, members of that uh, ethnic group are, died, are, sorry, are um, affected more uh, than other people are. They have a higher rate of diagnosis and mortality. Um, and we're trying to figure that out, actually, whether there's a biological or physiological reason or if it has to do with access to care. Um, I think there was actually something recently about African Americans and colon cancer that, uh, sorry? A gene was identified. A gene, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. A gene was identified, so we're learning more about the disproportionate rate of African-American diagnosis. Jimmy Smith did one for us to reach out to the Hispanic community. And uh, I mean, I hope, I think Mark's gonna be talking about this later. The CDC has been an incredible partner for us. Uh, sometimes I'm terrified because when I walk, go down the escalator at a number of airports in this country, I see a really big picture of me uh, urging people to get tested. Um, but I find that it's one of those things, and one reason why I'm still involved 11 years after Jay's death is, if you don't, I, I call myself the nagging fishwife, if you don't continue to really talk about this and keep it on the front burner, and even if you do, it's just simply too easy for people to put it aside and not, you know, make it a priority for taking care of their health. But I can't tell you how many letters and cards I've gotten from families who say, thank you, you saved my life, or 
you, you know, helped me, you motivated me to get screened. And it's really such a wonderful feeling, although some people give me a little too much personal information. Somebody sent me their x-ray of their colon, and I'm always like, thanks for sharing. But I really do appreciate the, the feedback I've gotten and the incredible support we have gotten from the Centers for Disease Control because they've helped us do a lot of these uh, efforts that we could not have otherwise uh, otherwise afforded. Uh, and so I'm really grateful to the CDC. Um, and we've had a number of benefits. We've raised, I think, close to $30 million for research. We have uh, doctors and experts from all over the country. And again, you know, I'm name dropping here, but this is a good crowd to name drop cancer experts with. For example, Bert Vogelstein at Johns Hopkins, who, you know, is really an impressive. I hope he wins the Nobel Prize for Medicine at some point. He discovered the Ashkenazi Jew gene, as many of you know, and he's doing incredible research with DNA and a stool test, because obviously if we can come up with a less invasive, less expensive screening procedure, that would be ideal. And I always hesitate to talk about that with a non-medical crowd, because I think it just gives people another excuse to put off getting a colonoscopy. But uh, he's one of our research scientists, Sandy Markowitz at Case Western Reserve, who is, is like Rick Moranis and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. He's, do she's, he's doing incredible work as well. Um, and we have a whole, Kenny, Kenny Slayman at uh, UCLA, who of course was very important in the discovery of Herceptin. Um, although I think there's some people at Memorial who may disagree with that, but I don't want to get into the politics. Because like anything, there's a lot of politics in cancer research as well. But um, I just, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all about the work I've done. And, you know, I think public advocacy work really does have a place in public health policy and can have an extraordinary impact and effect on, on how people take care of their, li their health and extending life and reducing mortality. And, uh, and I really feel, uh, you know, it's a bittersweet mission that I've embarked upon and I'd much rather have my husband uh, here by my side watching our daughters grow up and seeing that Ellie got accepted to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale this year. <laughs> but uh, I know, wasn't that amazing? Um, and, and to help me deal with a 13-year-old who doesn't want to be in the same zip code I'm in. But, uh, but, but clearly, uh, I can't really change what happened. And, but I can change uh, the discussion and, the com and I can direct the conversation. I'm in a very enviable position and I'm able to do that. And I hope uh, as a result that for every statistic you hear about the number of people who are getting screened, that means one more father or mother or grandmother or aunt or sister or brother or son or daughter who can be around for his or her family. And uh, that really does give me great joy and a real sense of purpose. I mean, I love my job. I love being in the news business. I had fun interviewing Sarah Palin, but um, that interview, I don't know if you've seen it, it's mesmerizing. Even after you've seen it 78 times or so, it's, it's very interesting to watch. But my, my, my real, the real joy and satisfaction I get is helping other people um, and being there and being an advocate for a disease that really, uh, before we got involved, was, was remarkably not only a silent killer, but really was silent in terms of public advocacy and awareness. So thanks so much. Good luck with your symposium. I hope that maybe what I've done can be useful in your countries as you try to increase awareness of this disease. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to all of you. So thank you.